Hi, my name is Mike Aven, and welcome to episode 25 of my beta campaign. We've got a few different things coming at you in this particular episode, including the final capture of that A-class asteroid, but uh, what the main theme is going to be is going to be the continual trials of the Samayaji, and what we have here is the Samayaji 2 with its cargo Junksat 13. Now you might recall a couple of episodes I completely destroyed the original Samyaji and at that time I said you know I should probably just rebuild the whole thing. Um, this is not that vessel because this vessel was actually already in the building queue at the time that the other one was destroyed. So this is the Samyaji 2 in name only. The Junksat 13, Jun Junksat 13 has got another one of these orbital insertion contracts around Kerb, and there's absolutely nothing special about it. So I'm just going to not even worry about showing you that part of it. That part of the mission went without any issues whatsoever. It was trivial. But uh, the main concern here is can I finally land this thing? I do apologize for all of this being at night as well. Uh, I had it, I am launching into an inclined orbit, so I had to launch at one of the ascending or descending nodes. But you know, thinking about it now, I could have fast forwarded another three hours and got the other node that would have been on the day side. The descent just happened to be at night too, so oh well, what 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 can you do? But anyway, uh, you might recall that one of the issues was that the uh, roll got inverted and. Uh, whether I had the flight computer going or SAS going, uh, this thing would start to spin crazily. Um, that turns out to be a remote tech issue. I pretty much nailed, nailed that down. I did some searching as well and found some other people that had same, the same sort of issues. Um, though I didn't find a solution to it, though I am noticing now for the first time that up to the top left button, the very first button on the flight computer is the kill button, and that button is supposed to kill and lock you into a particular attitude, so maybe maybe that button might help me out, but anyway, as you can see here, I, I do get that spin happening again. Uh, one thing I did do, by the way, is I've already armed the parachutes, I've learned my lesson on that one, so these parachutes are armed, so if I lose communication, they're going to go anyway. Um, I've also uh, lowered the communitron. So for a while there I had no communication whatsoever. I still do want to use remote tech though for this descent because there are periods of time where I'm going to be in uh, a communication darkness to where I won't have a communication link and the flight computer has that advantage of holding that retrograde um, retrograde vector through all of those uh, communication outages. So I'm just firing my engines just a little bit. Oh, there, there go the parachutes. There goes, oh, there goes the other one. So that's that's a good sign. I got my landing gear down too because I don't know when I'm going to lose this communication signal. Remember before, once, once Kerbin drops or the Kerbal Space Center drops below the horizon, um, I'm going to lose my communication link. I'm actually in the highlands, sort of to the north and to the north and west of the Kerbal Space Center and that's why I'm firing my engines. I'm trying to affect my trajectory just a little bit so that I can hopefully won't land on too much of a slope though I'm not feeling too good about it to be quite honest. And here I'm just burning my engines because uh, yeah I'm only about 150 meters from the surface and I'm trying not to but then the yeah I, I want to try and make my landing as soft as I can because I can tell it's it's a little bit hilly here but I just ran out of fuel, so uh, yeah, that's that's just what it is. So now it's just time to wait to hit the bottom. What are we, 30 meters, 20? Oh, oh, no, no, oh dear. Okay. Well, I don't know, the expensive bits are still good. <laughs> so at least I'm gonna get most of my money back on the recovery. It's just one of the docking bays and I think a fuel tank up at the top there blew up. So, uh, well, uh, not a partial success, we'll call that one. Well, we're going to get a couple more cracks at the Samyaji before this video is over. True Samyajis 2, where you'll get to see some of my redesigns, but we do have a few other things that we need to get to first. The first is to take another look at the Aristarchus. I got Robble in the Aristarchus, and she is doing one of these uh, temperature scan missions. These were all um, aerial temperature scans pretty close to the Kerbal Space Center piece of cake no issues whatsoever uh, so 
there's not much else to show besides what I've already shown, so we're going to move right on to the next thing, which is taking a look at the Arabata C, which is closing in on its rendezvous with its C-class asteroid. Now, the Arabata C has a construction that's very, very similar to the Arabata A, um, just heavier, right? Uh, the Arabata A was built out of 1.25 meter parts and an appropriate engine. This one has 2.5 meter parts and a much, much bigger engine and much more RCS and stronger RCS structures and more of them because, well, instead of having to lug around a rock that's going to be only a few tons, like a Class A rock, um, this Class C asteroid turns out to be 170 tons, which is quite a bit more than the Class A asteroid, so you have to build a heavier ship to compensate. Now, because the construction is pretty much the same as the Arabata A, it suffers from the same problems as the Arabata A as terms of, in terms of glitchiness. I can't use SAS. It starts oscillating if I use SAS. The only thing I can use is the flight computer to control this thing. But the, So the, the rendezvous and turns out to be pretty much exactly the same as it is with Arabata A. The only thing that turns out to be a little different is I had a little bit of trouble getting the grabber to engage here. I'm, I'm not quite sure why. I guess because I was hitting it uh, not quite flush on a bit of a, a hilly angle, but engage it does, and uh, then it's time to start to plan our capture around Kerbin. Now, with only 153 meters per second left, once I was connected to the... 170-ton uh, asteroid, I decided not to go and adjust the trajectory at all, but even with the 173 meters per second uh, at closest approach, if I just do a retrograde burn of that, I do get a nice little orbit. Well, not really a little orbit, kind of about the same size as Mimus's orbit on a bit of an inclination, but uh, yeah, I think that's going to work for me pretty well, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set ourselves an alarm for uh, how far in the future is that? Yeah, 26 days into the future, we'll come back to this and we'll perform this burn and finish off this contract. And that brings us to the next mission of the video. This is the rebuilt Samyaji. So let's go over what's a little different. First of all, these landing gears. Uh, uh, these, I think they come from B9. I'm not 100% sure, though. They could be KW. They're really neat. Uh, hopefully they give us a little bit more strength. But the one I want to really draw attention to, if I can get up here towards the top... These are smart parts. There's two of them, these orange things up here on the top. And they are set to uh, go off at certain altitude. When you hit certain altitudes, and you can set them to do different things, but I got them set towards altitude. What they will do is raise and lower that communitron automatically. So I have it set that it will lower the communitron at 40,000. 40, 40 kilometers, oh my gosh, 40 kilometers, and then raise it again at one kilometer. Um, really neat little parts, especially when working with something like remote tech, um, and it works through the action group. So what I do is I have the communitron attached to the RCS action group, so that if I push RCS on, it actually toggles the communitron. Um, I, can't, I don't have action groups yet, so I had to use something that I don't use, and this thing doesn't have any RCS on it. As far as the mission goes, uh, it's uh, JunkSat uh, 14, I think I'm up to. Yeah, JunkSat 14, <laughs> and um, nothing remarkable about the mission whatsoever. I really like these uh, landing legs, though, by the way, on the bottom that come from... Again, I think it's B9. Uh, perhaps it's KW Rocketry. It's one of those two for sure. They look a little sturdier. I don't know if they are because there weren't any uh, sort of force limit numbers that came with it. But what's nice about it is you can attach things underneath it very, very easily. So the, the engine clicks to the bottom of it very easily. It's just one part, by the way, all four of those landing legs. And you can actually attach things radially. So it's a nice little part. You undoubtedly notice that uh, I actually launched this vessel from the runway. That's a new feature that's built into when the beta version. When KSB went 0.90, they gave you the ability to easily uh, pull in crafts from either the space paint hangar or the uh, vehicle assembly building in either one of those two buildings, so you can launch from either one of them. Um, I wouldn't launch big rockets from the runway, but I thought, you know, this thing, it doesn't use launch clamps, it kind of stands on its own. Well, I thought maybe it would be appropriate to be able to launch it from the runway as well. 
Uh, it, it does seem to have a bit of a wobble. I don't know, this new one does seem to have this wobble. I don't know if that's from launching from the runway or if that's just something inherent in this thing. I'm not quite sure what's causing it to wobble like that, but as soon as it's done with the launch program from KOS, the wobbling ends up stopping. Now once again, I have no interest in showing you what JunkSat 4, 14 is going to do. It is a very trivial uh, orbital insertion mission. What we are interested in is can I finally land this thing uh, in a proper proper way? Now, the biggest thing, this one I'll, I'll call it right, I'll give it away. I, I, this ends up landing successfully. And I think the biggest change I ended up making that actually helped with the successful landing is being a little bit more particular with my landing spot. Before I used to just, uh, you know, use to trajectories mod, put the uh, landing icon on the Kerbal Space Center and just kind of see where I end up. Uh, now I'm going to deliberately put, go for the area that's a bit to the south and a bit to the east of the Kerbal Space Center and the re no, not to the east, I'm sorry, a bit to the south and a bit to the west of the Kerbal Space Center because I know there's a pretty large stretch of relatively flat grasslands there. And I think that is probably the best place for me to just continue uh, to, to deliberately aim for from now on. Now remember at uh, 40 kilometers I have this smart part set to turn off the RCS which will lower the communitron and hopefully protect it. Um, so we can watch for that and there you go and the red light there indicates that that uh, alarm, uh, that uh, event has just been triggered so now the communitron has been um, deactivated so it should be safe for re-entry now. I'm still going to keep using the flight computer because now I have no communication with the uh, Kerbal Space Center so the flight computer will hold this retrograde vector for me. I did try this with some trials of just you know um, seeing if just the natural aerodynamics will keep this thing tracking right and it doesn't. It, it, it just gets a little bit of a wobble going and in fact then parts start heating and we start getting uh, some dangerous explosions and stuff. In fact in one of my trials I ended up losing the entire craft that way. So I am going to keep using the flight computer despite the wobble thing, the the, the spinny thing that still happens, that, that, that roll issue is still there. Uh, I'm really interested in seeing if that kill button will help next time. I, I only thought about that though after our, uh, I recorded all this, so we'll see if that helps. But either way, this is completely controllable. I haven't armed the parachutes either because I have complete confidence that I will regain control well in time to arm the parachutes. Now we do get some pretty intense heating this time around. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it was a little bit differently, but Right, right here, there you go, those those are the air brakes. Now, they, they don't quite explode, which is good, <laughs> but they were pretty close there. Uh, it doesn't really matter actually if they did explode. If they did explode, I would have um, been able to still um, maintain control of the vessel. They're, mo they're more important when you're going really, really fast. So here, uh, I'm still using, I'm trying to control the roll. Again, remember the roll is backwards, so it's a little bit, a little bit weird, but uh, not too bad. And I'm gonna wait for that well, I've already deployed the parachute, so there we go. Just on the off chance I do lose control. I've gotten communication back right now. We're communicating with the Kerbal Space Center, which isn't that far away um, with the uh, DP-10 antenna, but I am looking like I'm going to be landing into those grasslands. Next time I'd like to be a little bit closer. Um, you know, the trajectories mod's not 100% with where it predicts where you're going to fall. And it always seems to, you always seem to come a little bit short of where trajectories is predicting you're going to go. Yeah, I'm descending the landing gear, getting ready because, you know, it is possible I might lose communication if the Kerbal Space Center um, drops below the horizon and the communitron doesn't end up working for some reason. Oh, there go the parachutes. And I do like, these are real shoots once again. I like the way they sort of spread themselves out like that. And remember at a thousand meters, we're going to, the another event is gonna get triggered that will raise an, oh, okay. Uh, that was the communitron. And you know what happened there is it got raised and then once it got raised, it exploded right away. Um, so obviously it's not, I, I think I can't raise it until uh, the parachutes are fully deployed, which they are now. 
So I think next time I'll just, uh, I don't know, lower that, that deployment distance to maybe about 500 meters. And this is looking very, very flat. And touchdown. There we go. Successful. So, there we go. Uh, I think I should be able to repeat that. I think I got a pretty good idea of where it is that I want to set this thing to go down. But we're not going to find out if I can repeat it until one more Samiyaji uh, at the end of this video. But right now, it's time to visit the Arabata A once again. Now you may recall that I, that I had this plan to put this asteroid in orbit around the moon, but it turns out I may have to uh, abandon that plan, at least for now, at least until I can get a ship up here and maybe refuel this thing. And what ended up happening is there was, and th this kind of thing happened, these are floating, round, uh, floating point decimal errors that happen in computer programs. Uh, and what was my nice about 40 kilometer closest approach to Kerbin turned into a 9,000 kilometer closest approach uh, when I wasn't paying attention and I came back and went, oh, this isn't any good. So I had to spend about 90 meters per second of delta V to uh, just get my encounter back into, my periapsis back into Kerbin's atmosphere. And then what I did just there is I did a little bit of a normal burn because I want to make sure to give a little bit of an inclination to my resulting orbit so that I can make sure that... Um, it doesn't end up encountering the moon as it goes around because if it encounters the moon it could get messed up and it could end up getting taken off the map. And then finally what I'm doing is I'm raising my periapsis and I'm looking at that max g-force and I want that max g-force to be in and around 0.2. And the reason why I don't want those g-forces to be that high and these are going to be the max g-forces as it goes through the atmosphere is because um, I'm going to have to go through this with the, at least the communitron antenna extended and I don't want the forces to get so high that that antenna snaps off and then I have no control of this thing whatsoever. Now as we close in on Kerbin for our arrow breaking capture, I suddenly and unexpectedly lost my communication link. And what ended up happening is that the uh, directional antenna, which is still specifically pointing at a particular satellite, it, it's pointing at a satellite GeoComSat 3, well, it ended up, GeoComSat 3 ended up on, not surprisingly, the other side of the planet as I got close to Kerbin like this, and I had neglected to raise my communitron, which I had lowered when I was doing the um, approach to the asteroid, because I was worried that the communitron would end up bumping into the asteroid and breaking off. So I ended up trying to lower antennas and lower these uh, solar arrays and getting kind of frustrated with it. And then suddenly I noticed, oh my gosh, that communitron, uh, I have no connection whatsoever. So I'm just going to have to go through the atmosphere and hope that none of this stuff ends up breaking off. Now the reason I'm so close in here is because I'm trying to find the base of the antenna so that I can click on it and attempt to uh, shut it down, even though I've yet to realize that uh, I don't have my communication link, so I can't shut it down. And you might be noticing that in here is just a glitchy mess of parts, especially the infernal robotic parts. They've all kind of glitched on top of each other. Uh, and yeah, this is another sign that this, 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 this vessel is on its last legs, I think. If I can just get this capture and be done with it forever, I'll be more than happy with it. But yeah, it is an, an, an official mess in here. I don't think Infernal Robotics gets along with those, uh, octagonal struts or those cubic octagonal struts. And I don't think I'll ever going to connect them to them again. You can see here how the antenna itself is like glitched right into the craft. It, it, it is a real mess. So once I realized that my communication link was gone, there was nothing left to do but to actually just kind of ride this out. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at two different things at the same time. One thing I'm looking at is the temperature of the parts. If, I mean, if I lose the solar panels, I could probably live with that um, and, uh, and deal with that. But if I end up losing that uh, dish antenna, then uh, yeah, I'm in I'm in a lot of trouble. So you can see now I'm starting to get the some nice heating effects there on the rocks, and I'm looking at the time to periapsis. And uh, you know, right now what's it doing? It's just past 25 seconds. If if I can get that down to zero, that that means I've just passed periapsis, and I'm on my way out of the atmosphere. The worst part of this is over, and I've survived. So as long as those parts remain shielded behind that asteroid as I go through, 
everything is good. And thankfully also the flight computer is set to the prograde, so I am going through this in a prograde direction. But I have no idea whether, you know, uh, KSP will model uh, protecting uh, that vessel behind the asteroid or whether it's just going to get hot and explode anyway. But anyway, it's looking pretty good. 12 seconds to periapsis. 10 seconds to periapsis. Getting a nice hot rock. Can you imagine if NASA did this, by the way? <laughs> this was their plan to capture an asteroid, and they just sort of had a press release to say, oh, yeah, oh, by the way, uh, we're going to, you know, save fuel. We're just going to have the asteroid kind of go through Earth's atmosphere for just a little while. Don't be alarmed. Everything's going to be fine. Two seconds. One second. There we go, and we've gone through periapsis. The solar panels aren't even getting that warm. Their temperature, they're only at negative, they're at negative one degree Celsius. It's awesome. So they are being sheltered, obviously, by that asteroid. I mean, if I went through the ship at this altitude, at this speed, those, those solar panels, I'm sure, would have gotten uh, torn off. So that's great. We are going to make it. And before anybody starts to think, you know, oh, why, why doesn't NASA do that? Why doesn't NASA aerobreak an asteroid? Keep in mind that, you know, r real world asteroids are a lot more complicated than what they are in KSB. They're not just, uh, you know, a, a collision mess with texture put on top of it. That's a nice, uniform, predictable object. Uh, you know, real asteroids are very complicated. Real asteroids uh, can break apart very easily. Real asteroids might might explode. They might might have gases trapped in them that can do unpredictable things. So, uh, yeah, no, arrow breaking an asteroid in the real world would be a bad idea. Anyway, it's a pretty simple matter now to get myself out to apoapsis and then to simply push my periapsis out of the atmosphere to achieve an orbit and finally finish off this particular contract. And that brings us to our final mission. Yes, once again, it's the Samyaji 2, uh, this time carrying JunkSat 15, and JunkSat 15 is on its way to a lunar orbit. But of course, that's not what we're really interested in. What we're really interested in is um, whether or not uh, we can uh, land this thing once again and make it two for two, two in a row. Well, not two for two. I guess it'd be like two for five, but you know what I'm trying to say. But anyway, um, as as for the, the mission itself, the JunkSat 15, uh, it is a lunar insertion mission, so I'm not going to even show it to you, but it is something that's a little bit different in that what you have to do is achieve a certain eccentricity. So what I would recommend to people, this is what I did, um, and this is an eccentricity between 0.7 and 0.79, which is a pretty eccentric orbit, uh, pretty close to being an ellipse as opposed to being, you know, more elliptical than it is being circular. And what I would recommend that you do is get yourself a very close encounter with the moon, you know, come in, you know, closest approach to being like, you know, 10 or 12 kilometers, something like that, and then get your capture and as you're getting your capture if you have something like Kerbin engineer, Kerbal Engineer watch that eccentricity come down until it breaks into the region that you want. If you don't have something like Kerbal Engineer you don't know what your eccentricity and then simply again do your capture but keep an eye on that contract requirement and when it goes green uh, you know that you got it. But of course it's not the contract that we're really interested in, it is the descent. So I'm going to go for that same area of grasslands that I did before. So again I'm going to use the trajectories mod to kind of help me out and help me plot this thing. And then it's uh, time to go and watch the descent. And uh, the only change I made between this one and the last Samayaji that you see is I adjusted that one smart part so that it will raise the communitron at 400 meters above the surface, um, and that should hopefully keep it. By then, the parachute should be explode or be uh, fully deployed. If they're not, I'm in a lot of trouble, and uh, I shouldn't get that communitron exploding. I should have communication all the way down to the bottom. Now, I've been talking about that kill button, and I'm, what I found out was, yeah, the kill button doesn't doesn't help. It doesn't. <laughs> what it does do is it locks your attitude to a particular, but then it turns, it's like locking it on to SAS is really kind of what it does. So, um, you know, and then kills all the other rotations that might be going on, but that doesn't help here. So, uh, yeah, that wasn't good. So, basically, I'm, I'm flying this in much the same way. I, I switch it over to, um, 
to the the regular stock uh, attitude controls, and and again the roll is backwards. But you know, I don't find that that big a deal. I do feel like I'm coming a little too close to those mountains that I would like. So what I end up doing is I end up uh, lowering the uh, the air brakes, so I'm not slowing down quite as fast, and hopefully that will mean that I will travel a little bit further. Uh, but I still am getting these these heating problems with the air brakes that I wasn't getting before. I don't know really what that's up what's up with that. I end up losing one of them, but it's it's not a big deal anyway. But I do clear the mountains without any problems and even get myself to a pretty pretty flat piece of ground and uh, yeah so we, we, we descend and the uh, communitron uh, raises itself at 400 meters without uh, without any drama without any explosions and uh, we touch down and yeah there we go so yeah there we go two in a row who would have thought it uh, I am closer to the mountains this could have gone worse I am closer to the mountains than I would like that's a little bit uncomfortable but uh, I think what I'll just need to do is when I'm using um, the trajectories mod, I need to just push that target point, the, the the predicted landing spot, a little bit out more into the water so that I end up a little bit closer to shore. But otherwise, uh, that's going to bring close to this particular episode, and we hope to see you next time.